All right, this week we're going to do a study on baptism, the subject of baptism in your King James Bible. And this is was a sermon request, and uh, so I'm finally getting around to it. But um, if you know anything about this ministry, you know that one of the primary ways that you can um, define words in the Bible is by a law that we call the law of first mention. What's the very first time that the word appears? Well, baptize shows up in Matthew chapter 3, verse 11. Baptized shows up in Matthew chapter 3, verse 6. Baptism, Matthew 3, verse 7. Baptist, Matthew 3, verse 1. I think it's going to be defined in Matthew chapter 3. I'm not really sure, but... <laughs> so those four words, baptized, baptized, baptism, baptist, all show up in the same chapter for the first time. Matthew chapter 3. So let's go to Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3. Okay. Now we're going to read the whole chapter here real quick. Just going to go through it. And then we're going to come back in a little bit. And we're going to dissect some of what's going on here. But there's some very important things here in this chapter that define a few different uh, types of baptism. Interesting study we have coming up here. Matthew chapter 3, verse 1. In those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan, and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance, and think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you, that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which bringeth forth bringeth not forth good fruit, is hewn down and cast into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh unto me, er, cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Okay? So that's that whole chapter there is the first time that baptism is mentioned. Okay? Now, as I've said in other studies, it's in the book, a collection of books called the New Testament. But doctrinally, anything before the crucifixion would have been the Old Testament. And the Bible does teach that the law and the prophets are until John. But since that time, the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven there. In this specific one, there's two different kingdoms. Mentioned kingdom of heaven is literal, physical, visible kingdom here on the earth. Kingdom of God can refer to that kingdom of heaven or can also refer to a spiritual kingdom. And I've done other studies on that. I'm not going to get into that. But the point is this kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom, is now being preached. So the law and the prophets are until John the Baptist. And from that time to the crucifixion, you have a different dispensation, if you will, there, where now God is starting to deal with the nation of Israel as far as he was always dealing with them, but now he's dealing specifically saying, okay, your king is here on the earth. God manifest in the flesh. He's here. So that's, you know, part of what's going on there, and this baptism thing lines up with that. All right, and we'll, we're going to be getting into this as we continue. But... Uh, <clears throat>
Next we're going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. You say, well then, uh, so then Matthew was the very first time that baptism happened, right? Not exactly. See, the law of first mention, you know, you don't just use that 100% of the time. You know, I mean, now, now Matthew chapter 3 will explain what baptism was and, you know, some of what's going on there. But the very first baptism was not in Matthew chapter 3. See, when was it? 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and look at verse 2, and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Hmm. What was the first baptism in the Bible? The children of Israel when they crossed the Red Sea. And the cloud of witness there, you know, the, the cloud, or not the cloud of witness, the, the cloud that, you know, uh, basically led them by day. Okay, that was what's going on there. But they, when they went under the sea there, they went under the water. It wasn't that they went like this above the ocean. They went down in, and the walls of the ocean are on either side. God parted the sea, and they walked through on dry ground. So they went under the water. That'll be important as we continue. But the fact is that there are seven different baptisms. There's a lot of number sevens in the Bible, your King James Bible. And it's always a reference to God or to completion, things like that. And so God chooses seven different types of baptism. Now the first three there we've already seen. Okay, first you have the baptism of John in water. Okay, Matthew chapter 3. He's there, he's baptizing people. We're going to look about that in, in more detail as, here as we continue. Second one there that John mentioned is a baptism of fire. Now, again, we're going to look at this thing, but it's not some kind of the Holy Ghost being like fire and he comes upon somebody. You read the context, that's not what it's talking about. It's talking about lost people in the lake of fire being baptized for eternity. <laughs> you know, you can either get baptized now or get baptized in eternity. But um, the third baptism there of the seven is the baptism of Moses in the cloud and in the sea. We just read about it there in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. So you read about that one. But now the other four baptisms, I'll give them to you here. It's baptism of the Holy Spirit, baptism of Peter to Israel, baptism of Gentile believers, and baptism of suffering. All right, so we're going to look at these seven different baptisms. Let's start out going back to Matthew chapter 3. And we're going to cover some of this in a little bit greater detail now. Matthew chapter 3, verse 1. Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. In those days came John the Baptist, and that doesn't mean he was an independent fundamental Baptist either, by the way. Not quite the same thing. Preaching in the wilderness of Judea. And saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. By the way, if you want the reference here, let me just stop there for just a minute. It's over in Matthew chapter 11. If you want to see any some scripture to prove that this is a physical kingdom. Matthew chapter 11, verse 12. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven, heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. So it is a reference to that physical kingdom over there in Israel, Jerusalem. And if you know anything about that, part of the world, they're always fighting over there. So that's what's going on. That's what he's preaching here in verse 2. Verse 3, For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan, and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. Okay? Now, you say, what's going on there? So these people were coming and they, they were being saved. Well, if they were saved, they wouldn't have need, needed Jesus Christ. Now, I believe what was going on here in this thing is that the kingdom of heaven now is at hand, and because the king is there, and we're going to see that, you know, here as we continue in the study, and now nationally, uh, as a people, as, as a nation of Israel, they were to purify themselves, confessing their sins. Why? Because they're about ready to go into the kingdom. The king is there. Now, of course, they rejected their king, so the kingdom got put off. 
all right, that final part of the covenant, the Abrahamic covenant, where they get the land, that had to be put off because they rejected their king. So, very interesting there. But you see them coming out to John to be baptized. Now go next to, jump down to verse 13 here in Matthew chapter 3, because the verses we're skipping over there we're going to be talking about next. Verse 13 through 17, Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. Now, you know, if this baptism was a baptism to forgive sins and things like that, then why would Jesus have needed to be baptized? No, see, he was going through those same, that same uh, thing there with the rest of the Jews. Nationally, as Jews, let's, you know, purify ourselves here and, and you know, be baptized. It was, it was symbolic what Jesus Christ was doing. He did not need to be, you know, have his sins, you know, confess his sins or have his sins taken away or something like that. And there's another reason which we're going to get into here uh, over in the book of John. But let's continue. Verse 14. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? See, John's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> You're God manifest in the flesh. I'm not going to baptize you. I'm a sinner. You're not. Let's see what Jesus says. Verse 15, And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered it. Or then he suffered him. Now suffer there in your King James Bible, if you don't know about this, suffer means basically to allow. Suffer me to do such and such. Allow me to do such and such. Is what he's saying there. Verse 16, And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him, and lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So, it's confirmed there that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the prophesied Messiah that was to come for the Jewish people. And that would not have happened without that baptism. Okay, turn next to John chapter 1. John chapter 1, verse 29 through 34. And this gives, a sim this gives another account of this event that happened here, but with some added detail here. John chapter 1, verse 29 it says here, The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me cometh a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me. Wait a second. John the Baptist was born before Jesus Christ. So how could Jesus Christ be before John? Because Jesus Christ is God. You say, there are no clear verses in Scripture proving that Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh. Oh, there's lots of them. There's lots of them. Right there's another one. Okay? So, John looks and he says, Behold, Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Verse 31, And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore am I come baptizing with water. So why was John baptizing with water? Well, to purify the nation of Israel, but also to fulfill, to fulfill prophecy there, to fulfill what the Lord told him was going to happen, that when you're out baptizing, basically, that God manifests in the flesh, the Savior, the Messiah, is going to come to you. And it's going to be confirmed. Verse 32, And John bare record, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same as he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost, and I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. Yeah. That was the purpose of that baptism. That was a very unique baptism. Right? That baptism was to show who was going to be the Messiah, who was going to be God manifest in the flesh, the king that had come to Israel. Next, we're going to go back to Matthew chapter 7, or Matthew chapter 3, excuse me, verse 7. Matthew chapter 3, verse 7. And now we're going to talk about the second baptism. Okay, first you have that baptism of John there, the, the one in water. 
there that was done to purify the nation of Israel and to prove that Jesus Christ was God manifest in the flesh. So now we're going to look at the baptism of fire. Matthew chapter 3, starting at verse 7. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Okay, now I just want to make a point there quick. It calls it his baptism. So this was a specific baptism that was given to John the Baptist to do for that specific time period and to show that Jesus Christ was God manifest in the flesh. The Son of God, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. It was given to one man to do. This isn't some kind of a thing, in other words, that we're supposed to continue to this very day. To show that, you know, the purifying of the nation of Israel and things will just baptize people and, and people come and they confess their sins and then we baptize them and then eventually Jesus will come and we'll, you know, that's already been done. So this is a unique baptism. But it's interesting there, the Pharisees and Sadducees, why did they come? Did they come to be baptized? No. They came to critique what John was doing. Just like a lot of the uh, religious people will do today. The Bible believers. They'll study us, they'll, they'll read our books, they'll watch our videos and things like that. Why? To critique us. They're not interested in what we had to say. They're just interested in you know, causing division, making trouble. Verse 8, you say, how do you know that, Brian? Well, verse 8, bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance. What I've been preaching for a long, long time, you get these people and they say, I'm, a, I'm saved, I'm a Christian, I, I believe in Jesus Christ and everything else. Okay, what are your fruits? Meet for repentance. Is there a changed life? Do I see a changed life? Maybe kind of like today, a good example would be some, some Catholic priest would come and and uh, want to see me preach, you know, or whatever, and and uh, and he says, oh, "Brother, I'm I'm for you." I say, "Well, um, still got your priest outfit on." Oh, well, yeah, but you know, I'm all for you. I say, "Well, have you left the Catholic whore?" <laughs> and he'd say, "No, but I'm for you." Um, have you denounced Catholicism? Are you speaking out against it? You know, are you using a King James Bible? No, I'm not doing any of those things, and, and I'd still pray the rosary, and I, I still, you know, do the confessional thing with people, and I, you know, still do whatever, whatever. But I, I'm a Christian. No, you're not. No, you're not. There would be a change. That's what John's saying right here in verse 8. Bring forth, therefore, fruits meet for repentance. Prove to me that you people aren't here just to critique me, is what he's saying. Verse 9, And think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father, for I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which bringeth, forth, bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. You know, again, I just want to say this quickly, and that is people say that the Bible is not scientific. Well, the Bible is very scientific. You see, in logging, uh, the logging industry, they have something called a cull tree, C-U-L-L. -L. Okay, what it means is it's a tree that is very crooked. It's not really straight. It's not good for anything but firewood. You don't take a crooked tree and send it to the sawmill and try to get straight boards out of a crooked tree. It doesn't work. Now, you can saw a straight board out of a, out of a tree that has a, has a sweep to it or whatever, but the problem is you have, you know, I don't want to get into too much technical terms here, but you get into different, the wood there, if you have a tree that's leaning really heavy, the wood will grow different on each side of that tree because it's, it's having to compensate for all the weight leaning this way. So what happens is you get that nice straight board at the hardware store and that board, you bring it home and it dries and it goes like that, it looks like a ski. You know, you make a sleigh out of it perhaps or something, but you're not going to be doing too much with when you need a straight board. And so you get a lot of these trees out there in the forest. They're twisted. They're, they got knots on them, a lot of branches, a lot of damage or whatever else. They, they grow at an angle or they grow and they're like this as they grow, spiral green bark and things. What are they good for? Firewood. And you get fruit trees. They don't produce fruit. What do you do? Take the axe and lay it to the stump there down at the roots area. Cut it down. Use it for firewood. That's what's going on there. So, scientifically, you can see that it proves this thing scientifically, but also there's a spiritual application there. 
what did John just rebuke? He just rebuked these false religion people. And they aren't bringing forth fruits, meat for repentance. So you get this person that's in religion all their life and stuff. You go back to my Catholic priest analogy. And he's never leaves the Catholic system. And he never denounces Catholicism. And he keeps doing the rosary. And he keeps confessional. And he does all this other stuff. What's the point? God eventually cuts him down in the prime of his life. Just like a tree. You cut a tree down, it stops living. You don't cut a tree off at the roots and it falls down and, and then it continues to live. No, it doesn't happen like that. And you cut, God will cut down these sinners that don't bring forth fruit, meat for repentance. And what's he do with them? Let's continue reading. Verse 11, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Okay, now there's a very important little mark here in your King James Bible. Right there between the words ghost and, ghost and end, you know, right in between there, there's a little comma. Now, that separates the statement, okay? It's not the Holy Ghost and fire. It's the Holy Ghost, comma, and with fire. Two different things. Not the Holy Ghost is a fire that comes upon you. You know, I remember I used to see these charismaniac uh, Babel buildings and they'd have this, you know, the people going like this with their hands up, you know, and they'd like, have this dove, like flaming dove coming out, out of heaven or something like this, you know, like, and you see Benny and he's like, I put fire on you and all this stuff. <laughs> uh, no, no, that's not what this verse is about. And even Mike Hoggard came out and did this whole thing with the, you know, he messed this whole thing up here, said that this was the Holy Ghost and fire. Uh, no doesn't work. You see, what is it? Verse 12, whose fan is in his hand and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So he gathers the wheat into his garner, but the chaff he burns with unquenchable fire. You say, well, Brian, that's just talking about, you know, just literal. He's just talking literally. Um, when's the last time you ever saw a harvest, wheat harvest or whatever, where they take the wheat into the garner and the chaff there, they burn it and the fire never goes out. It's not quenchable. Uh, no, it's not talking about literal things as far as here on the earth and wheat and chaff. It's talking about saved versus lost. And that unquenchable fire that they get burned with is found in Revelation chapter 20. Let's go there. Revelation chapter 20, verse 11. The final judgment for the lost dead. Revelation chapter 20, starting at verse 11. We're going to see what this baptism of fire is, what it will culminate in. Revelation 20, verse 11. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them, and I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now back in the old days, a lot of times you had Christians would go out and they would baptize people in lakes. There's still a lot to do, you know. It's a good place to baptize people. You say, why? Well, there's plenty of water there and you can just kind of dunk the person down and bring them back up. But can you imagine what it would be like to see that lake? Let's say there was an oil spill or something like that and it was almost totally just oil all through that thing and all of a sudden it lit on fire. Say to people, who wants to go take a dip? Who wants to go swimming in the burning lake? You wouldn't have one person that would say, oh, 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 me. And yet that's what the majority of lost people do when they go to hell. Or when, when you talk to them about hell, you know. And you'll get people, you know, oh, I'm going to hell, who cares? They don't really understand it. And, you know, their hearts are hardened many times because of living a life of sin and they have no desire to change or no desire to turn. They, they're scared of what will happen, the reproach of Christ that will come upon them. 
you know, scared of what their buddies will say, you know, cowards, cowards down here. I mean, you know, be more afraid of, of people than you are of burning in a lake of fire, you know, and, and what's the picture there? It's not going to be that the devil's going to be down there baptizing people in the lake of fire. No, no, no. You're going to be drowning. There's people that go to hell to that lake of fire. They're going to be basically trying to, to, to stay up above the surface of that thing, and they're going to be going down underneath and then coming up. And, then, and you know, it's like fire and brimstone the Bible talks about. Brimstone is, is the Bible word for sulfur, so it's going to have that smell of rotted eggs. It's going to be like raw sewage almost. And you'll be drowning in that forever. Burning. But you're afraid of your friends at work and what they'll think of you. Yeah, you got your priorities straight, don't you? Oh, what are people on YouTube? What if they make fun of me? What if people on my, you know, on the internet say bad things about me? <sighs> sure. So you can either be baptized but the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost come upon you when you get saved or you'll be baptized in eternity in the lake of fire. The choice is up to everybody out there. God doesn't force anybody to go to the lake of fire. All right, you say, what about the devil? The devil could have stayed right with God in the beginning as it created as the anointed cherub that he was. But the devil chose to rebel against God. And by the way, Matthew chapter 25 says that the, that hell, there, the lake of fire, was created for the devil and his angels. So, because of the devil's sin, God created this place, this lake of fire, this terrible, terrible place, and you don't have to go there unless you reject Jesus Christ, which most people do, sadly. But now let's look, go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We're going to look at the next baptism here, the baptism of Moses, back there in the Old Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1 through 4. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and did all eat the same spiritual meat, and did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. Interesting because here in the New Testament we have basically two ordinances as Christians, things that we keep not necessary for salvation, which I'm going to talk about more as we continue here on the thing of baptism. But these things, these ordinances are ways to show, you know, consecration, sanctification, things like that, you know, communion and baptism. All right. And you don't have to be baptized more than once. Okay, but communion is a thing that you do in remembrance of what Jesus Christ did on the cross. And to judge yourself, that's the purpose of communion. But baptism is to show your death, burial, and resurrection as a new creature in Christ Jesus. Okay, and then you go forth to bring forth meat, fruits, meat to repentance. See, there are tie-ins there. That all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness. So yes, John's baptism is not the same thing that we have today, but instruction and in righteousness, yeah, there is some tie-ins there. There definitely are some tie-ins. But um, just find it interesting that you see there in, in verses 3 and 4, you see the thing of spiritual meat and drinking. You know, and that drinking that, you know, that they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. So you see this thing there, kind of a, a pre-type of, you know, the communion thing where Jesus is like saying, you know, drinking my blood and eating my flesh in a figurative way, not literal, because obviously he was there literally, and no one came up to him and bit his arm and drank his blood. You know, he was speaking uh, spiritually. And... But you see this thing actually as a type given back there in the Old Testament. So they're baptized in the, at the Red Sea crossing, and then they take communion, if you will, uh, out there in the wilderness. Pretty interesting thing. But look at verse 5 here in this chapter. It says here, With many of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. You say, well, then baptism always saves. Didn't save them. 
Okay, they, they went through that thing, that, and the Bible calls it baptism here, but it didn't save some of them. If you read again, you read the book of Exodus. Uh, they were doing a lot of sin and things like that, and God was a lot of time killing them, sending them straight down to hell. I mean, opening up the earth, in they go. You know, let's continue reading here. Verse 6. Now, these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Okay? These things were our examples, in other words, of what happened in the Old Testament. Neither be ye idolaters, as were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed, and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted, and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happen unto them, for in samples... And they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Okay? So the things that were going back going on back there in the Old Testament, thousands of years ago, those things happened and were written down specifically for you and me today, upon whom the ends of the world are come. You know, we can still learn from that. It's not the, oh, they were very primitive people back then, and we sure don't make the same mistakes today. Oh yes we do. Yes, we do. We still make a lot of the same mistakes back, then, you know, that they were making back then. We can make idols, things that can get in between us and our Bible, us and our walk with the Lord. You say, like what? Oh, I don't know. Television, entertainment of all different types, internet, you know, watching a whole lot of videos when you should be studying the Bible or whatever else. See, there are kinds of, you know, all kinds of things like that. Fornication. You start watching movies and things that they glorify fornication all the time. It's incredible, you know. And uh, tempting Christ. The Bible talks about grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed. Can you grieve the Holy Spirit of God with your actions, with things that you say? If you watch last week's sermon, be careful what comes out of your mouth. Mm -hmm. Don't tempt Christ. Okay. And neither murmur ye. Do you complain about things? Are you content with such things as ye have? First uh, Timothy chapter 6 talks about having food and raiment. Let us be there with content. Are you content with food and raiment? <laughs> kind of rough, isn't it? So there you see the next type of baptism there. It was a kind of a prophetic thing as to what would happen in the future. What about the baptism of the Holy Spirit? 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Just turn over two chapters there, basically. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12 and 13. It says, Here, for as the body is one, and hath many, many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be, whether we be bond or free, and have all been all made to drink into one body. Spirit. So you see it there in verse 13. We are all, are, are we all baptized into one body? Now, there's a movement, uh, these um, Baptist briders, I think they call them, the Baptist bride, you know, heresy thing. And they, they try to teach that there are different bodies and things like this of believers. Uh, no, there are different members, but they're all one body. And they say, well, that's universalism. That's what Catholicism teaches. No, it's not. Okay, Catholicism teaches that they are the one true church. And they try to pervert this teaching of there being a universal church. Um, but again, they're stealing this thing from the Bible. They're not even in the one body. It's kind of funny, actually. But the fact is, there is one body. And I had a you know, number of go-arounds with, with some of these Baptist writers over the years. And they'll just keep going back. There's multiple bodies. There's multiple bodies. And I refer to these verses here. One body, one body, you know, that's what it is. And, you know, they'll, they'll say about, you know, you're, you're getting out of church and things like this. I can't get out of church. I'm saved. I'm born again. I'm part of the one body. And there's one church. You know, though you can have local congregations and things like this. You can have small groups of members of the body getting together. But we're all united. Okay, we're all part of the body of Christ. 
You know, I'm not part of the body of Paul and you're part of the body of Christ and you are part of the body of James and part of the body of Peter. It doesn't work that way. One body. And we're baptized into it. You say, well, how's that baptism happen? Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 through 6. It says here, there is one body. See it again there. And one spirit, even as ye are called, and one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Okay? One body, one baptism. Galatians chapter 3. Turn back to Galatians chapter 3, verse 26. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Okay? As many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Okay. Verse 26. For ye are all the children of God by baptism in Christ Jesus. No, wait. By water? No. Um, it's by faith. Baptism won't save you. Okay? Now, should you be baptized? Yes. But it won't save you. Baptism is symbolic. I'm going to show you as we continue in this thing. But it says, Therefore, as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And what is that baptism? How does it come about? Faith. The verse right before it. It doesn't say one thing at all about water. Nobody's getting wet in that whole thing there. Okay? Faith. Turn next to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. Okay, it says here, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Now you read the rest of the chapter there, we're not going to today, but if you want to read Romans chapter 6, he's talking about that thing of you don't have to live in sin anymore. You have an ability to fight these sins. And before you get all excited and say, then we can be sinlessly perfect, he goes on in Romans chapter 7 to say that he still sins, that Paul still is a sinner and he still sins and messes up. Okay, so it's not that we don't sin anymore. It's just that sin should not have that power like it used to have when you were lost. And if sin still has some kind of a power where you're just, you really don't even care. It's not so much about, I can't get rid of this certain sin. I'm addicted to such and such or whatever. You know, there are things that you can be addicted to and it'll take you years to get rid of that thing. Um, so I don't, I don't judge people too much on fleshly sins. But when you have people that, have no conviction about that sin and they don't really care, you know, about it, eh, that's a problem. Because there should be a dying to that sin, dying to the old man there. But you see, what happened when Jesus died on the cross? Right? Jesus Christ died on the cross and he came down and they just kind of left him out there in the open, you know, and stuff like that. No, no. Jesus was taken down off the cross and he was put in the grave, you know, See, he died, he went into the grave, and in three days, he came back up again. So when you go and you're baptized, you go into the water, and you go down under the water, and then you come back up, symbolizing death, burial, resurrection. A new creature in Christ Jesus. You say, well, then I have to do that to, to be able to fight sin and things like this. No, no, you don't have to do that. But it's what you're doing there is you are showing the lost world, 
I am, you're confessing Jesus Christ, basically, in a, in, a, in a way there. You're saying, I am that old man that I was, you know, the one that used to tell the dirty jokes, the one that used to laugh and things like this and swear and, and laughing at dirty jokes, I meant to say, you know, and I used to do all these things and I was a bad person and whatever else. I just died. That old man's dead. My faith put that old man down. And now that old man's dead and buried. And now I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus. See, baptism is very important, but it is not the actual thing that saves you. That's very important to understand. We're going to see about that as we continue here. So we see there the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Okay? It happens with faith. Now you have baptism of Peter to Israel. Right? Acts chapter 2. Now, early on in the book of Acts, Acts is a transition book. So you have the... They're all Jews. They're going. They're speaking in tongues, and they're and they're doing all this stuff. They have the Pen day of Pentecost there in Acts chapter two, and and there's a lot of things. They're still going to the synagogue. You know, it's like don't talk to the Gentiles. That comes later on. You know, they're starting to. You see this transition starting to happen, and the Jews as a nation reject Jesus Christ again, even after you know they rejected him as king, and then he dies on the cross for their sins, and they reject him again. You know, we have no king but Caesar. You know, so Roman Catholicism has been the greatest persecutor of the Jewish people since the first century. But, so you have this early part of the book of Acts, you're going transitionally here from the Jews being ministered to as a people to now both Jews and Gentiles later on. So you have to be careful about doctrine. Acts chapter 2, verse 36 through 39. Let's read these verses. It says here, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart, and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost." You say, well, then that's the same thing we should do today. Repent. You know, we should have people repent and, and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And then they'll get the Holy Ghost. No, because we saw earlier that for Christians today in the Pauline epistles, it's faith that gets you the Holy Ghost. Faith that gets you into the body of Christ. Well, why is it saying here, baptism in the name of Jesus Christ? Why? Because we're dealing with a slightly different setup here. You're still dealing nationally with a people. All right? Let's see, where am I reading to you? Verse 39. For the promise is unto you. Who is he speaking to? Verse 36. House of Israel. So he says, For the promise is unto you and to your children. And now he's starting to say about the gospel is starting, is going to eventually go to the Gentiles and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Right? And we see later on in Acts chapter 17, he says, Paul says, the time of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. So Acts is a transitional book. That's why you have to be very careful about the early parts of it. There's the part over here in, um, just to give you another example, over in Acts chapter 4, verses 34 through 37, it talks about that they had all things common, you know, that whole thing, and they were... Uh, you know, selling as many as were possessors of lands or houses, sold them and brought the pieces, prices of them that were sold, or those things that were sold, you know. And they're they're distributing to the poor and they're, they're like, you know, doing all this thing here. They had all things common, you know. And it didn't work out, you know. They were expecting Jesus Christ to come back, you know, and return very soon. They weren't expecting this nation of Israel to reject Jesus Christ and go into this whole long church age here, you know. It was a transition book. That's why you have to be really careful about getting doctrine out of Acts chapter 2. And another thing that uh, people like to take out of Acts chapter 2 is the thing of speaking in tongues. And the, interesting too there, let me just go over here in Acts chapter 2 verse 3. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire. And it said upon each of them. And they'll say, see, baptism of the Holy Ghost and with fire. No, 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 no. First of all, we already looked and saw in Matthew chapter 3 
the baptism of that was going on there in Matthew 3, Holy Ghost was saved and fire, unquenchable fire, you know, that's the fires of hell, the lake of fire. That's what's going on there. And right here in Acts chapter 2, again, every word of God is very important. It says, tongues like as of fire. You know, you get some guy and you say, man, that guy runs like the wind. Oh, then he is the wind. No, no, he runs like the wind. You understand what the Bible's saying there, you know? Some people don't. But you say, I, I'm sorry, Brian, I don't agree with you. This, this Acts chapter 2, verse 38 is the gospel for today. I know the, the Church of Christ, you know, the Campbellites, they, they get into some of this stuff. It's baptism, faith and, you know, your repentance and baptism. That's what it is. You be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. You got you got to be baptized that way. You know, because if you don't, you know, then you then you're not saved or something like that. And uh, you know, they'll say you shall receive you shall receive the gifts of the Holy Ghost. Well, first of all, I already showed you in with the last baptism one that we looked at there that the baptism of the Holy Ghost, the baptism of the Holy Spirit there comes from your faith in Jesus Christ. But I'm going to show you a little problem here for you if you were saying that Acts chapter 2 is for us today. Turn in your Bible to Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10, verses 42 through 48. Okay, it says here, And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of quick and dead. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. See anything about baptism there? No. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. Wait a second, where was baptism mentioned? Oh, they were probably already baptized, right? Let's keep reading. Verse 45, And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they, had, for they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God, then answered Peter. Here's the, here's the key. Verse 47, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. Wait a second. So earlier on here in the book of Acts, he's saying, Repent, be baptized for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Okay? Later on, as the book is transitioning, it comes in and it says, You believe? You have faith in his name? Faith in Jesus' name? You can be saved. And they go, we believe. See? The Holy Ghost comes upon them. And then Peter says, why don't we baptize these people? Can any here forbid that they be baptized in water? No. What are we dealing with? A different thing. You say, what's well, a contradiction? No, it's not a contradiction. Unless you're non-dispensational, then yes, the Bible contradicts itself quite a bit. You know? But when you rightly divide the word of truth and you look and you say, okay, Early on, they're going to the Jews, and you have the thing of, you know, this this thing of, uh, you know, baptism there in the name of Jesus Christ and things. But when they reject Jesus Christ as a nation, okay, now it goes to individual Jews and Gentiles, and now they can get saved by faith in Jesus Christ, and then baptism comes after that. Baptism is merely an ordinance now, where you get baptized in the name of the Father and Son and Holy Ghost. You get baptized and to show your death as an old man, and your burial of the old man, and then resurrection as a new creature in Christ Jesus. That's the purpose of baptism today. And let's look here at the baptism of Gentile believers. Matthew chapter 28. Of course, we saw a good one there in Acts chapter 10 here just a little bit ago. But Matthew chapter 28, you, you are going to see this thing here where Jesus Christ when he was here on the earth, he was always, you know, speaking to his disciples, and a lot of times they just weren't getting it, you know. And he was speaking far out ahead of them, and they really weren't quite getting it. <laughs> and you say, well, they sure were dumb back then, but we're smart today. 
Oh, uh, well, no, not really, because I think there's a lot of things about the time of Jacob's trouble and the future time periods that are coming that we don't really understand. And, uh, you know, I know there's some things I, I just, I've gone over it and over it and over it. I read commentaries and I read books and it's like, mm, it just, just doesn't really explain it, you know. And, and I don't think we can truly understand the next dispensation, you know, because we're not really appointed to that. We're not appointed to that time of Jacob's trouble. So to have perfect understanding of all the events of the book of Revelation, don't think it's really possible for us today. You know, I, I mean, unless somebody's uh, got some kind of special insight that I don't know of or something like this, you know, I just, how can you experience all the trees, you know, a third of the trees being burned up? How can you, how can you rationalize what it's going to be like and all the facets of that thing, how it's going to happen? And how can you look at this and look at that and, you know, I mean, what's it like to, to not be able to go and buy and sell? Unless you have the mark of the beast. What's that going to be like? You know, we don't know. You know, to realize that God himself is pouring out judgments on the earth and you're stuck here. I don't know what that's going to be like. I'm glad I'm a member of the body of Christ. I'm going to be with the Lord. You know, I mean, anyhow, going off on a tangent there. But Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 and 20. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. So there you see Jesus Christ saying, Go and baptize all nations. And that's, again, you know, meaning salvation comes through faith in Jesus Christ, and then you get baptized to show that new creature in Christ Jesus. Go to Acts chapter 8. We already saw Acts chapter 10, Gentiles being filled with the Holy Ghost and then being baptized afterwards. But let's go to Acts chapter 8. We'll see another Gentile. Acts chapter 8, verse 34. Okay, it says here, And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or of some other man? Now, if you know the story here, you can read this whole thing. Um, but uh, if you go up to verse 27 there, it talks about a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority. And so this guy was a Gentile. And he's there in his chariot, and he's riding along, and he's reading Isaiah. And, you know, Philip joins himself to him, and, he, and he's saying, Okay, you know, I don't understand. What am I reading here? Verse 35, Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down. You say, wait a second. What about verse 37? Well, verse 37 is not in the oldest and best manuscripts, according to the Alexandrian pervert scholars. You say, oh, why would they skip over that one? Let's read the verse. And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So you see, they want to take away that saving faith that comes before baptism. They skip the saving faith. Interesting. You say, why would the Catholics do a thing like that? Oh, well, because they baptize infants. And an infant can't possibly have saving faith to know that they need to be saved and then get baptized. They come into the world with the stain of original sin and they have to be baptized, have water poured on their head to take away their original sin. Sure, sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. And the cow jumped over the moon and, and uh, you know, the dish ran away with the spoon too, you know. Verse 38, And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, and the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. Okay, this kicks two things that are very near and dear to the heart of Catholicism. First of all, you have a man having faith in Jesus Christ before being baptized. An adult man. 
not a little baby that has no say in the matter. So it kicks baptismal regeneration. So they teach that you're dead in trespasses and sins, I guess, when you're, when you're born, that you, you know, the stain of original sin is upon you, and until you're baptized, you're not really regenerated. You know, you haven't received the first initial dose of grace, you know, your first grace vaccine from Catholicism, you know. And then you get more grace vaccines down through the years for penance and, and you know, saying prayers and doing the rosary and all this other pagan nonsense, you know. So that's what they're, they're doing there. They want the baby to be baptized to become an official member of the church, you know. And things. Well, I guess that comes at confirmation later on. But <clears throat> they're baptizing infants. The Ethiopian eunuch is not an infant. And he shows that there's a profession of faith before he gets baptized. The second thing that they want that this passage here proves is what happens when he says, okay, we see the water there, and they went down both into the water. You don't need to go down into the water if you're going to have a little bit sprinkled on your head. You know, take a little cup and you go like that, pour a little bit of water over your head, there you're baptized. You don't need to go down into water to do that. You say, well, maybe they just went down to the water. You know, it says into the water. Maybe they just kind of, you know, Philip had to go down into the water to scoop some out or something. But well, verse 39 says, and when they were come up out of the water. So they were in it. They went down there. The unit gets put down under, comes up. So that passage there was attacked in the Catholic Bibles simply because it debunks Oh, two of the most sacred things in Catholicism. Sprinkling the head with holy water. You know, they have these pagan altars and things. Hold the little baby there and they pour water on the head, you know, and things. It debunks the, the thing of sprinkling and it also debunks baptismal regeneration, baptizing of infants. All right. Now let's go next with the baptism of suffering, the last of the seven. Matthew chapter 28. We've seen a lot of different modes of baptism. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 28. Or sorry, Matthew chapter 20. Excuse me. Looking at my too high up there. Matthew chapter 20, verse 20 through 23. Then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons, worshiping him and desiring a certain thing of him. And he said unto her, What wilt thou? She saith unto him, Grant that these my two sons may sit, the one on thy right hand and the other on the left, in thy kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, Ye know not what ye ask. Are ye able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of, and to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They say unto him, We are able. <laughs> no, they didn't really understand what was coming. He said, What was the cup there? Are you able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of? You know, what was a cup? The wrath of God that came upon Jesus Christ when he's dying on the cross to paying for our sins there. Our sins were paid for on the cross. So the wrath that should have come upon us, that we deserved, Jesus Christ had to drink of that cup. That wrath that got poured out. You know, and Jesus is saying, are you able to have God pour out his wrath on you like this? And be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? What was the baptism there? Did Jesus Christ go and get under the water and things like that when he was on the cross? No. What he's baptized with there is the sufferings. That's suffering for sin. That's what he's baptized with. But look at verse 23. They said, you know, we are able... Verse 23, And he saith unto them, Ye shall drink indeed of my cup, and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared of my Father. Now, then they, you say, then they both had to die on the cross as well. Well, no. But what it's saying there is, what Jesus is saying is, I'm going to die and, and suffer on the cross to pay for sins. And you aren't going to have to do that exact same thing as far as actually physically being nailed to a cross and dying that way. But the Bible says if you're going to be one of Jesus' disciples, you have to take up your cross daily and follow him. Okay, You will have to crucify the flesh. And you will have to suffer. 
You know, and there are times, brethren, it's it almost seems like you're being drowned in in suffering. <laughs> you know, there are things that just like, you know, uh, times that you'll just get, you know, days where you just think to yourself, I shouldn't have even gotten out of bed today. I mean, you wake up and it's just like this goes wrong and that goes wrong and just thing after thing after thing after thing. You know, I just had a day the, the other day here and it's like um, my, <clears throat> my one vehicle you know, broke down, and, uh, and you know, and, and it was like, uh, that broke, and then something else, I, I forget even all what it was, but it was just, talk about a bad day, and it was just like, I had a headache, and I'm like, you know, all these different things going wrong, and it just, I said to my wife, I was like, oh, I wish I wouldn't have even gotten up today, I mean, it was just, it was a bad day, really, really bad day, and you'll have times where you'll just, as a, as a Christian, you'll just get attacked, you have family members just turning against you that you never thought would happen and just all this bad stuff. Well, you're going through that baptism of suffering. And it's interesting because the Bible says if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. All right. First Timothy chapter. Let me look that up quick. I want to get my scripture right on that. Or is it Second Timothy? I don't have this in my notes here. Lord sometimes brings scriptures to my mind while I'm preaching. Sometimes my notes don't exactly line up with my preaching notes. 2 Timothy chapter 2, uh, verses 11 and 12. It is a faithful saying, For if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. So you have to suffer with Jesus Christ. You will have that baptism of suffering come upon you as a Christian, you know, and it'll be, like I said, there'll be times it just feels like it's getting piled on, <laughs> like you're just getting suffering poured on top of you, and just like, is this ever going to end, you know, and it will, you know, the Lord will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able to bear. So there we see the seven different baptisms, okay, just to review them here quickly, baptism of John and water. Okay, specifically there to announce the arrival of the King, God manifest in the flesh, the Jewish Messiah. Secondly, you have the baptism of fire. For those who reject Jesus Christ, you will go and you will be baptized for all of eternity in the lake of fire. Number three, you have the baptism of Moses in the cloud and in the sea. So you have the children of Israel being led of that spiritual rock, having to drink in things of that spiritual rock, just like drinking today and symbolically drinking of the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed on the cross, our communion service, so to speak, okay? So you have that. Then you have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, okay? When the Holy Spirit, when you believe by faith, you're put into the body of Christ. So you're brought in there uh, by faith, and now you have the Holy Spirit. That comes at faith, not at a water baptism, then you have the baptism of Peter to Israel. Okay, that early part of the book of Acts there, the transition part there where you have the nation of Israel having another chance for salvation and after they reject Jesus Christ, now you have baptism of Gentile believers and Jews as well. You can still get saved if you're a Jew. But the baptism of Gentile believers comes through faith and baptism in water only comes as a ordinance, as a, as a way of saying, here I am, to be baptized, I want to show that I've died, and I'm going to bear the old man, and I'm going to start over now. And then you have the baptism of suffering, which will naturally come upon you if you have gone through the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the baptism of the Gentile believers. Guaranteed, you will suffer for Jesus Christ, unless you totally keep your mouth shut, and even then you'll still you know, suffer at some point in time. It just is inevitable. It just happens. All right. Now, a couple questions here. And by the way, first of all, let me just say this. Um, if you notice two things, and I talked about this in Acts chapter 8, um, no baby, you know, the Ethiopian eunuch was a man, an adult, a consenting adult, believed by faith in Jesus Christ, and then he was baptized. That's the baptism, the only true biblical baptism right now. But interestingly, if you study the whole Bible, Genesis to Revelation, you study that whole Bible, 
right there, you're not going to see one time where any baby is ever being baptized for the remission of sins. You know, for this to remove the stain of original sin. That's not there. Baptismal regeneration is not a biblical teaching. Number two, nobody is ever sprinkled on their head. You're never going to see a time, and you can look it up on the internet. I mean, there are pictures and things, these Catholic paintings and things of these, you know, John the Baptist, and he's got like a little seashell, and he's like sprinkling on Jesus' head and stuff like this for his baptism. Nonsense. You know, Jesus goes down into the water. You know, again, you don't go down into the water if you're just going to take a little seashell or whatever. You don't need to go down up to your waist. You know, in these a lot of these Catholic paintings, they show them standing there in, their, in the water up to their waist, and John the Baptist is pouring a seashell full of water over Jesus' head. Nonsense. But here comes the questions, okay? Because these are the ones I get. Can a Christian baptize, can any Christian baptize a convert? Okay, or does it have to be some kind of an ordained special pastor? Well, here again, we go back to this thing of we have departed so far away from uh, the original intent of the church, the church being a group of believers, and you had the original there, the apostles were going out and they were you know, ordaining elders and things in every church, and you had multiple elders in different groups and things like that, and, and then they would preach and teach the young men, and they would become elders, and then it spreads out that way. So you would have had a much greater spreading out of, of Christians to do, you know, Christian elders to do baptism. You know, so you could have made the argument that back in the first century, back in, or even in other places where it's better organized, you know, than a lot of places here in the world, you know, you can, you could have uh, elders that would travel to a certain area or something. Hey, you get people saved and, you know, now an elder comes and they can baptize you. You could make that argument. But now with the internet and the whole digital age thing, you know, I get a lot from people in other countries, a lot of emails and things, and they say, there's no one here. There are no churches. There, you know, if you want to go with the modern Babel building thing, there's just, there's not anybody here. What should I do? I want to be baptized. See? Well, you have to have a special ordained elder to go over. No, I don't believe that way. Um, baptism is... It is not a necessary means of salvation. Salvation is by faith in Jesus Christ. And what you're showing by your baptism is that I'm now going to consecrate my life more to the Lord. I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to move forward in my purpose to, to really destroy that old man. Okay, it's, it's, it's a symbolic gesture of you, um, you know, uh, your life to Christ now. It's very similar to the thing of a wedding ceremony. Um, a wedding ceremony, a Bible wedding ceremony, there's no such thing as a woman in a white, you know, gown walking, you know, well, I shouldn't say that. Actually, Revelation chapter 19 talks about the bride of Christ arrayed in white, you know, so... There is that. But a lot of the things about marriage ceremonies, you know, saying vows and things like this, till death do us part and all that, um, it's not scriptural. You don't really see that uh, in the scriptures. It, you know, talks about a, a, you know, man goes in and he knows his wife, you know, and stuff like this. It's usually families get together and they have some kind of a little ceremony of some kind. Then the husband takes his wife and he goes and, you know, knows her, you know, what the Bible means by that. And they become husband and wife at that point in time. And you say, well, then we shouldn't have, you know, marriages, actual marriages with a woman dressed in the white and a man dressed in the nice suit or whatever. No, no, I, I don't say that. You can have those things. That's perfectly fine. And you're, the ceremony, the outward ceremony is, is a gesture of you saying, we're now husband and wife. We're doing this thing publicly before man, before God. We're not going to hide on the, in this thing and just pretend that we got married and you know, go fornicate at some motel someplace or whatever and say that that's our marriage ceremony. No, no, no. You know, you're doing something, you're making a public profession of your love for one another of your marriage. Well, that's why that's important. Do you have to do it a specific certain way? No, not necessarily. And so it is with baptism, okay? Um, baptism is not salvation. Baptism is not something that you're going to go to hell if you don't get baptized. But it is a ceremonial kind of a, you know, way to show I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus now. So it is important. And I think, you know, getting back to what I was originally saying, 
can a Christian baptize just a regular Christian, not somebody who's an elder? Uh, can they baptize another convert? Yes, I do believe so. Um, if if the uh, New Testament church was still you know really functional, like it, it you know we had organized groups of elders that were spread out all over the world, well you could maybe say well you know you should have an elder come or whatever, but it's at the point now where things are so disorganized and broken down and stuff like that. It's just, there's no way I can travel all around the world. I mean, uh, you know, that's not the ministry that the Lord's given me. So I would say, yes, a Christian can baptize a convert. And uh, can you baptize yourself? That's another question. Can you baptize yourself? Um, well, honestly, I've not seen any scripture for that. I've not seen any scripture where people are baptizing themselves. And, you know, again, it's what is the purpose of baptism? It's, it's you showing people that you are, you know, death, burial, resurrection. So if you're doing it just all by yourself, well, there's really no witnesses there. I mean, what's the point at that, you know, point in time? So I would say no. I would say baptizing yourself, mm, no, no. Uh, I'm not really for that. I think that you should, you know, um, yeah, because it, there's so many scenarios now. That's why it makes this so difficult to answer these questions because, you know, you have uh, some guy in some other country and he gets saved from watching videos here on the Internet and it's just like he wants to be baptized, but he's like the only Christian at all. What's he do? I understand, you know, it's just like, <laughs> again, I would just pray. I would simply pray and ask the Lord, you know, please provide another Christian brother that, that could baptize me, you know, and, and just serve the Lord. That would be my recommendation. Is baptism a requirement to be saved? Third question there, no, no. It's not a requirement to be saved. Again, it is like communion, where it's communion is a thing where you're examining yourself not to stay saved, you know, to keep yourself saved, but to keep your sins judged so you stay in fellowship with the Lord. That's what it's about. Okay, so baptism is not a requirement to be saved. Um, I recommend it, strongly recommend it. Make sure you get, you know, by full immersion, you know, not this little, you know, sprinkle. Some guy takes a little Dixie cup and, you know, squirt gun, you know. Some, no, 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 no. <laughs> no. You know, and, and watch out, too, for this thing of, I remember this uh, friend of mine the one time went to a Methodist Babel building, and they said, you know, he said, I want to be baptized. And they said, oh, yeah, we could schedule that. And he said, yeah, but I want it by full immersion. They are like, oh, well, I guess we could. We could do that out in a creek or something, I guess, you know. And he was like, good, when can we do it? And he was like, well, first I have to ask you the question, were you ever baptized before? Because if you were baptized as an infant, I can't re-baptize you as an adult. There again, it's Catholic, this whole Catholic thing. You can't be baptized twice. Nonsense. Absolute nonsense. Okay, and it's funny because that's where the term Anabaptist came from. It meant somebody that's re-baptizing adults. Catholic heresy, just pagan nonsense. So, hopefully that answers the questions. Um, there's a lot of different angles that you can go with this study on baptism. A lot of different, you know, we didn't cover every scripture today. I just wanted to hit this subject kind of give a kind of a brief understanding of it, but, you know, just don't get sidetracked with this thing of, like, the Church of Christ, and I know some others will teach that, you know, you have to be baptized to be saved. No, you don't. Uh, you have to be baptized to receive the Holy Ghost. No, you don't. Okay, we saw from our study today that, that the Holy Ghost comes upon you at faith, at belief. Again, the charismatic Pentecostal whole nutty movement there they teach that you get saved and then the Holy Ghost comes later on when you start to speak in tongues. No, I don't think so. And they'll teach the thing of the baptism of fire. Uh, the Bible does not teach the baptism of fire for saved people. Okay, if you are being baptized in fire, that means you're burning in the lake of fire. All right. doesn't mean you're saved and, and the Holy Ghost has come upon you and he's like a fire and stuff. No, no, no. You know, Acts chapter 2 says, like as a fire. So don't be deceived by that. Well, let's close here with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you, Lord, for baptizing us. 
that are saved and, and putting us into the body of Christ. And that we know that it doesn't matter what kindred we are, where, we are, where we're at, what our position is in life, we're all members of that one body. And I thank you, Lord, for that privilege. I thank you for um, just what you did on the cross to pay for our sins. And Lord, I, I pray again, Lord, for those out there that, that are trusting in their own self-righteousness and uh, believing that things like baptism and, and whatever else and confessing of sins can save them. Lord, it's only by your blood, your death, burial, and resurrection that we can be saved. And I just pray, Lord, for all the Christians out there that they would walk in newness of life and not resurrect the old man, but that they would... Uh, be new creatures in Christ Jesus. And if they've messed up, Lord, this past week, I pray that they would uh, get it confessed and forsaken and move forward. And I just pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, that will be it for this study on baptism. And uh, more definitely some more interesting studies coming up here. But... Uh, a lot of the studies, you know, are going to take a lot of research. So, you know, I've, I've been getting some really good requests and things. Some of the brethren have been asking about. There, I get this thing. It's, it's more and more and more I'm getting the requests for it. And I really do want to do something on it. But I just don't feel like I can until I do some uh, pretty heavy research into it. And I just never have researched it because to me it's so ridiculous. And that is this whole Hebrew Roots movement you know, the sacred names of God and all this Hebrew root stuff and stuff like this. It is it is the synagogue of Satan when people say they are Jews and they're not, you know, and you have all these people, all different types of people, white people, black people, you know, all these different things. I'm a Jew now. We're the true Jews. Oh, shut up. You are not. You know, give me a break. If you're a true Jew, then go over to Israel, you know, whatever. You know, and then, they, and then they'll try to say that I'm Jewish or something like this, and they, you know, yeah, you're a Jew or... <laughs> What a bunch of nuts. But, you know, I'm going to try to get that done at some point in time, but um, there's just so much to study on that and so many ridiculous claims and ridiculous people in that movement. So, you know, I'm going to try to get around to that eventually. Um, a couple other studies that people have been asking for for a while, but uh, what, you know, as I've explained this before, let me, I'll explain it one more time here before we close. Um, what I do a lot of times is I, uh, my wife and I both, uh, she helps me a lot with the research and, uh, what we're doing many times is we're working on four or five, six studies oftentimes, uh, all at the same time. And we're doing research for one and we take a break from that for a little bit and then we go do research for this one. Then we do research for that one. And I have these sermon requests and things and I'll, I'll like be going through my day and I'll get some material for this sermon and I'll put it into those notes and I'll get and then I'll be like some of you will send me an article or something I'll think oh that'd be good for this sermon and I'll put it over there into that one and whatever else so I'm constantly working on sermon ideas and it might take me a half a year to bring out a certain subject but it's because I'm doing all this research and putting it all into the file there and, um, and that's why it'll take me sometimes a long time to get to this but I just I want to I've covered most of the major doctrines of the Bible, I believe, um, and you know, because my calling is mostly about, you know, um, subject matter preaching. I do some expository, as you've seen, but um, I do a lot of subject matter preaching and answering this and answering that. And I had a a brother out there um, sent me a message, and he said, you know, could you also do some videos defending the King James Bible, looking at supposed contradictions, and that's actually been something that's I have it in my uh, upcoming video projects, so to speak. Um, and I have some other videos that I have coming up defending the nation of Israel um, and just defending them as a nation, not, not debunking Anderson and his stupid lies, but actually just defending the nation of Israel. So I have that stuff coming up. I have the answering Bible version supposed ca um, contradictions and things. It's all just projects. It's all on the, you know, you say about the back burner. Well, we have a very big stove with a lot of burners, you know, <laughs> and a lot of things on burners, you know. So uh, we have some really interesting stuff that the Lord is showing us. Um, we will be bringing out 
uh, but I'm just going to intersperse it with just studies on, um, like like this one here, baptism. It's baptism is a very interesting study, but it's not one that you know you have to go and find a lot of different research. I mean, you can prove pretty much everything just from the pages of Scripture. Just compare Scripture with Scripture. So, but that is going to be it for this week. Please keep us in your prayers. And I um, don't think I really have any other announcements right now. So that will be it. We will see you next week. Not sure what we're going to be talking about yet, but uh, we will see you then. That's it. Thank you.